Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the conservation of biodiversity and in this lecture we shall explore the benefits from conservation. But before let us look at the principles of reserve design that was left over from the last lecture. Now when we are designing a reserve there are certain principles to be kept in mind and these principles exist for us to have the maximum bang for the buck meaning that for a unit of effort for a unit of funding we should be able to conserve the majority of species that is our cost per unit species conservation should be the least possible so they make for the prin uh, the principles of the reserve design so what are these principles one is big is better than small so if you have if you have got two options you can make either a big reserve or you can make a small reserve you should always go for making a bigger size reserve and why because if you have bigger sizes it means that there are more number of habitats more number of habitats means that there is a higher species diversity and so if you are trying to make a reserve there will be certain inputs that you will have to make you will have to go through a certain legal process in the country there could be things like public consultations so if you have to do all these processes you have to take the politicians into accord you have to take the locals into accord you have to make plans you have to make public consultations you have to make a drafts the drafts have to be ratified and finally it has to be published in the gazette to be notified as a sanctuary or a national park now when all of these have to be done they will these processes will have to be done either for a small reserve or the same processes will also have to be done for a larger size reserve so if you have to make a reserve better go with a bigger size reserve once you make a large size reserve there will be a great amount of habitat diversity and so the reserve will be able to support a larger number of species more amount of biodiversity will be conserved by making a larger size reserve but it also has another plus point it is often more secure and easier to manage per unit area so there is more security and it is easier to manage why because when you have large habitats more habitats then the larger size populations will be less susceptible to extinction why because we will be having the diminishing population paradigm that will be acting here but the small paradigm uh, the small factor paradigm will not be acting because the population sizes will be sizable they will be large and so we will not have the small population dynamics acting in these populations so there is a greater amount of security at the same time if you have larger size reserves then you typically have a smaller perimeter per unit area now this would make for a less cost of protection now this is so because if we consider say a circular reserve with a radius of r now in this case the area is given by pi r square and the perimeter is given by 2 pi r now in the case of a reserve the species are getting a habitat in the form of area whereas the cost of managing the reserve the cost especially of protecting the reserve will depend on the perimeter why because the outside influences if poachers want to get inside they will come from outside and so all of this perimeter needs to be protected so perimeter is an indication of the cost and the area is an indication of the benefit of making this reserve now if we do a ratio of cost is to benefit it will be given by p divided by a which is 2 pi r divided by pi r square so pi and pi get cancelled r and r get cancelled so this is 2 by r 
so essentially the cost is to benefit ratio is proportional to 1 by r or it is inversely proportional to r so if r increases that is you are making a larger size reserve then the cost to benefit ratio reduces and which is what we want we want to have the maximum benefit for the minimum cost so the cost to benefit ratio should be as less as possible which means that the radius should be as large as possible if you make a larger size reserve there are more benefits with lesser costs another benefit is that it is less vulnerable to catastrophes since smaller catastrophes will not impact the whole area now what does that mean if you have a small size reserve and suppose there is a forest fire then there is a good chance that this reserve is completely destroyed whereas if you have a large size reserve and then you have a forest fire say in a large area but still you will have time to combat this fire so possibly you will be able to stop this fire in this zone so this area is destroyed but this area remains if that happens the organisms that are there in this area after some time they will be able to repopulate these areas that have been destroyed so in the case of catastrophes if there are smaller catastrophes they do not impact the whole area and because they do not impact the whole area so certain number of organisms do survive and these organisms will make it possible to repopulate the whole area whereas in the case of a smaller size reserve if you have a catastrophe such as a forest fire then by the time you will be able to put up a substantial amount of action against the forest fire to douse it probably the fi the fire would have spread to the whole of the reserve because in any case the reserve is a, a very small reserve and so all the organisms will be lost and then you will find it next to impossible to repopulate this reserve back to the original conditions so a larger size gives the populations more amount of resistance and more amount of resilience more resistance because the smaller catastrophes do not impact the whole area so some of the organisms will be left and more resilience because these organisms that are saved from the catastrophe they will be able to repopulate the whole of the reserve and bring it back to the original state so which is why it is always good to have larger size reserves another principle is that one big is better than several small of the same total area so here again if you have got two options and you are making the same size reserve but you have two options one is to make it as one body and second is to make it as four or five different smaller bodies of the same total area then you should always prefer making one large body because here again your cost is to benefit the ratio will be less so you will be able to reap more benefits with lesser cost of protection and the organisms will be much more secure next if you do not have the option to make a large size reserve at least try to make reserves that are close together now why is that so because when you consider reserves that are close together then the animals can move from one reserve to another reserve very easily so there is very little amount of human dominated landscape that these animals will have to traverse and with frequent movements these small populations will start to behave like a big population or a population of populations also known as a meta population meaning that if suppose here the uh, this small population begins to reduce in size so there are some stochastic things that occur because of which this population is reducing in size when that happens individuals from here can migrate individuals from here can migrate individuals from here can migrate and so 
there will be certain source populations and there will be certain sink populations and con continuous movement between these populations will happen in such a manner that the small population dynamics are more or less countered now this is only possible when you have these small populations that are close together clustered together but if these populations themselves are very far apart in that case the animals will find it very difficult to move from one place to another place because there is a huge amount of human dominated landscape in between and in such cases they will not behave as meta populations and so the small factor dynamics will play a role here 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 and here and in that case all of these four populations will face a huge threat of extinction so given a chance always prefer to make close reserves that minimize isolation not just close cluster them a cluster permits much more movement than a linear arrangement of reserves now in all of these cases what we are trying to do is that we are trying to negate the effects of the small population dynamics by creating movements between different populations so that they behave like like a large population another thing is that we should always prefer to have circular reserves because they have less biotic pressure what does that mean if we consider a reserve that is of this shape versus a reserve that is say of a linear shape now in both the cases the threats are coming from outside so when we talk about things like poaching when we talk about things like cutting of trees people are coming from outside similarly when we consider competition due to um, grazing of animals that competition pressure is also coming from outside now these pressures will not probably reach towards the core of the large size reserves because people tend to move for smaller distances because if you think from the point of view of say a poacher or an illicit logger then they would prefer to enter into the reserve perform their operation of tree cutting or uh, killing animals and then they would try to move back outside before being detected now if they try to move very much inside the jungle in that case the chances of being detected increase a lot and so in a vast number of cases we can draw a line towards the center and from the boundary which would be the zone of influence of outside pressures so this is the zone of influence now in the case of a circular reserve we will have a large area on the inside that will be free of any of these outside influences whereas in the case of reserves that are stretched like this then the zone of influence from here it would cover something like this and from here it would cover something like this and in that case the whole of the reserve will be a zone of influence of the outside pressures and in such case there will be no area in the reserve that is free from biotic pressures or free from pressures of the surrounding human beings now we created a reserve to protect and conserve the wild animals from these influences so if these influences are able to reach every nook and corner of the reserve then it does not make any sense to create a reserve in the first place and so we always prefer to create circular reserves because they have less of these biotic pressures now this is an example from mudumalai tiger reserve now this black outline is the mudumalai tiger reserve these blue areas are the settlements inside so in uh, many circumstances we do not have reserves that are completely free of human influences but we might be having certain settlements inside so people are living inside people are doing cultivation people are doing cattle rearing and if we drew the biotic pressure zones or the zones of influence then 
if we consider uh, so this red is showing us a two kilometer buffer yellow is showing us a five kilometer buffer blue is showing uh, an eight kilometer buffer and green is showing a 10 kilometer buffer now if humans and their cattle are able to move inside to say 10 kilometers then there will be no zone that is left in this tiger reserve that would be free from the external influences even if humans are able to move only five kilometers then too you will find that a majority of the tiger reserve will be within the zone of influence and so we will not say that this is a very good design and probably this gives us an idea that these settlements on the inside they can probably be relocated by giving certain amounts of compensation so that more and more of the reserve becomes an inviolate area for wildlife another principle is that connection is important so if nothing else works at least try to maintain connectivity because connections permit animals to move from one part to another part or from one small reserve to another small reserve creating them into a meta population and negating the influences of the small factor paradigms so how does it work in practicality so suppose in the state of madhya pradesh we need to design new sanctuaries and the question is where should they be located so we can begin with things like biodiversity intactness index now this is an index that gives an idea about which locations currently have a substantial amount of biodiversity and in which locations the biodiversity has already been more or less eliminated so in this map we can see that these dark colored patches are the ones where the biodiversity still remains and when we next look at the areas where the the uh, reserves and the sanctuaries already exist so here we have a map which shows that here we have kuno palpur here we have ghati gaon sanctuary here we have karera sanctuary so these dark colored areas are the ones where we already have the reserves now if we are trying to create new reserves they should be in areas that are well connected that should be having a substantial amount of biodiversity that can be protected and that should be in areas that have a good amount of connectivity that is we know that animals are already moving from one place to another place now madhya pradesh being the tiger state of the country we can look at the tiger connectivity between all of these different areas now this red color is showing us the tiger connectivity so these areas have a substantial amount of tiger connectivity meaning that it is known that tigers move from one place to another place by taking these routes these dark colored routes so if we wanted to make new sanctuaries in madhya pradesh we would prefer to make them in these locations so now if you look at the biodiversity in intactness index if you look at the existing sanctuaries look at a gap analysis and also look at connectivity we can locate the areas where new sanctuaries can be constructed so this is how these principles play a role in actually making a decision about where to place the sanctuaries and in all of these locations we can then look at the principles of reserve design and try to create as large as a sanctuary as possible now in a large number of cases when we try to create a large sanctuary it might be having certain habitations inside now if there is a habitation and if people are getting irked off in those situations they may turn anti animals or anti conservation so for a large part we try to keep all the settlements out of the sanctuaries so that people retain their rights and they become pro conservation because the the sanctuaries will be providing them with certain benefits the sanctuaries will be providing them with lots of employment mostly through tourism plus lots of ecosystem services without having any negative influence on their rights so this is how the things play in the practical context so when we talk about these benefits what are the benefits that we get from conservation 
now we can classify the benefits in certain categories but the umbrella term used for these benefits is ecosystem services the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems and typically well functioning resistant and resilient ecosystems so the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems are known as ecosystem services and these are primarily the benefits of conservation so when we do conservation we create an area or we protect an area in such a manner that it maintains its nature as a well functioning ecosystem and when it is a well functioning ecosystem it provides certain benefits to people and these benefits are known as ecosystem services so these are the benefits from conservation so what are these benefits so ecosystem services can be classified into several categories the first is provisioning services so these are the services that provide something they give something and mostly material things so they provide certain materials and because of that we call them as provisioning services so what are the provisioning services well functioning ecosystems can provide people with food food like honey food like spices food like wild fruits so these are different things that are being provided by a well functioning ecosystem and so these come under the category of provisioning services then these ecosystems also provide several raw materials such as timber or fuel wood or fodder or organic matter so these are also the provisioning services they provide genetic resources in the form of crop improvement genes now these are very important especially because in modern agriculture we control the situations to such a large extent that very little amount of variation is possible so if you consider paddy cultivation the paddy crop will be given a large amount of water and irrigation is assured for these paddy crops because of which they have not developed any drought resistance for a very long time now given that we are currently living in a context of climate change given that there are a large number of diseases that are coming up and destroying our crops especially crops such as coffee now in these cases if you wanted to give drought resistance or resistance against pathogens to our agricultural crops where will we get the genes from the answer is we will get these genes from the wild relatives of the agricultural crops this is because the wild relatives live in changing conditions there is nobody in the forest to give them water nobody to spray herbicides or weedicides or fungicides on these plants so these plants are able to survive in the wild conditions only because of their own inherent tendencies and a large fraction of that is genetic traits so they have those genetic traits that give them drought resistance flood resistance resistance against diseases resistance against insects and so on now if you wanted to give these resistances to our own agricultural crops we can take these genes and move them into the agricultural crops through processes such as hybridization and selective breeding so that is another provisioning service that the well functioning ecosystem provides to us in the form of genetic resources then it provides us with purified water because if you consider a water that is rich in sewage rich in sludge and if it if this water moves into a wetland what happens in the wetland there are so many organisms that feed on the organic matter that is there in the water and by that they reduce the amount of biological materials that are there in the water they reduce the biological oxygen demand in a large number of cases the bacteria that are there in the sewage water will be eaten up by other microbes that are living in the water so wetlands provide a huge 
provisioning service in the form of purified water so they pro they purify the water and provide the purified water that can be used by humans another provisioning service is medicinal resources medicinal plants as a organisms and so on now in a large number of cases the plants that live in wild conditions they develop certain chemicals that are used against other organisms especially insects and especially against diseases these chemicals are by products of metabolism and these metabolic by products also have medicinal properties so if we talk about traditional drugs things like quinine so quinine was extracted from the bark of the cinchona tree now in the cinchona tree quinine used to provide resistance against insects to the plant resistance against herbivores to the plants because it is such a bitter substance that organisms would not prefer to eat the cinchona tree or the cinchona plant now this quinine also turned out to have anti malarial properties so this is another provisioning service that well functioning ecosystems provide medicinal resources they also provide us with energy in the form of hydropower biological fuels and so on so we can also extract energy which is a again a provisioning service we also get ornamental resources feathers shells flowers fur butterflies and so on so these are several provisioning services that are being provided by well functioning ecosystems at the same time they also provide a large number of regulating services which means that they regulate something now ecosystems regulate things like the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because they perform carbon sequestration and through carbon sequestration they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they add it in the form of biomass into their own bodies in this way they help reduce the impacts of global warming they also play a big role in climate regulation because areas that are near forests they are typically cooler than the urban heat islands so if in a city you have certain patches that have forest then that would cool the surroundings now similarly if we talk about large size forest they are able to provide a climate regulation impact on a much greater surrounding next they perform the regulating service of biological control of pest population especially through predation for instance a large number of insectivorous birds that live in the forest they feed on insects and they also reduce the insect population in the surroundings which means that if you have a forest nearby the agricultural farmlands in the vicinity they will not have to spread a very high dose of insecticides why because the birds are doing the job of removing the insects so that is another regulating service waste decomposition and detoxification here again we have the processes of degradation of organic materials and we also have the process of bioremediation so in the process of bioremediation the plants take up the toxic materials especially the heavy metals and they deposit them in, into their own bodies when they do that the water that is passing through is uh, made uh, more purified because the heavy metals are removed from that water so this is another regulating service waste decomposition and detoxification so we have bioremediation then the plants also purify air and water especially when you talk about the plants in those areas where we have lots of dust storms so the leaves of the plants they act as barriers they reduce the wind speed and they make dust fall and so they reduce the amount of dust that is there in the vicinity that this is another regulating service they provide protection against floods this is done because the water that is falling on the ground 
is moved into the groundwater reservoir through groundwater recharge and at the same time the speed of the water is reduced and so we do not have a large quantity of water that comes into the water body at the same time when water comes slowly then we do not have a flood like situation whereas when all the water comes together then there will be an inevitable flood so this is another regulating service protection against flood groundwater recharge they also protect against disasters such as hurricanes and tsunamis by acting as a physical barrier against the impacts of hurricanes and tsunamis so they act very much like a storm surge barrier like a sea wall and when there is a tsunami then water cannot rush inside because the wall of trees can protect the coastal areas against these waters then ecosystems also provide number of supporting services such as soil formation and humus formation now we have seen this before in the context of weathering of rocks that we have biological weathering which is facilitated by biological organisms such as plants and animals so this is a supporting service in the form of provisioning of soil which has a large number of uses mostly in agriculture they also perform nutrient cycling which is again a supporting service they perform primary production and oxygen generation meaning that they convert carbon dioxide into biomass and this biomass sustains a large number of other organisms because this acts as food for other organisms and in this process they also generate oxygen now we have observed before that the great oxygenation event that changed the composition of the atmosphere it was brought about by plants and plants are still doing the job of oxygen generation which supports all different forms of life so this is another supporting service provisioning of habitat for biodiversity so where would tigers live if there were no forests so tigers reside in forest areas because the forests are home for tigers and similarly well functioning ecosystems provide homes for a large variety of species so they conserve biodiversity this is another supporting service then there are a large number of biologically mediated habitats such as corals and mangroves another supporting service is pollination if we did not have the insects the uh, birds the animals that are there in the forest who would do the pollination so this is another supporting service that well functioning ecosystems provide next we also have a large number of cultural services such as recreational services people go out into the forest which are eco tourism sites they go out for outdoor sports so these are different cultural services scientific and educational services for example well functioning ecosystems are good areas for scientific studies for discoveries for excursions if you had to teach people about botany where would they find a large variety of plants to understand say different leaf forms or different types of growths of plants so well functioning ecosystems also provide a role for scientific studies if you wanted to study the animal behaviors the whole field of ethology is based on well functioning ecosystems then we also have a large number of religious and spiritual services that are being provided because a large number of trees and animals they have religious significances they have spiritual significances people worship trees people worship animals and so they provide a service which is even a religious and spiritual service then there are certain cultural services they are used as motifs for books films paintings and so on they provide therapeutic services such as ecotherapy meaning that in certain countries if there are people who are suffering from say anxiety or suffering from depression then the psychologist would make a prescription that they should go out visit a forest area and when they go out when they see trees all around when they hear the chirping of birds the minds are calmed 
So this is another service. This is a therapeutic service that the forests provide. Then they also provide a lot of inspiration. Inspiration to writers, inspiration to poets. And a large number of our uh, books and uh, poems have been written in forest areas, taking inspiration from forest areas. So there are n number of ecosystem services that well-functioning ecosystems provide. If we did not have lush green forest, if all the areas were just barren lands, probably we would not be having large number of books or many poems or many films. So there are several ecosystem services that are being provided by the forest. Now how do we do a valuation of these services? For that we can make use of models such as the INVEST model. INVEST stands for Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. This is a GIS based suite of open source software models for mapping and doing valuation of ecosystem services. Now valuation of services becomes important for two reasons. One, it allows us to have a greater understanding of what all ecosystems is a system providing. Because when you want to do a valuation, you have to list down the various ecosystem services to do a valuation of each and every one of them. So this makes us stop and think about the various ecosystem services that a well-functioning ecosystem is providing. And two, it allows us to take decisions. If there is a forest that is being diverted to say create a mine and this mine would provide a total of say 100 crores of rupees to the economy in the form of jobs, in the form of raw materials. But if the forest by itself is providing services worth 500 crores, so in that case you will probably not want to divert the forest into a mine. But to have this decision, it is important to do a computation of the various ecosystem services that are being provided. So models such as the invest model permit us to make these computations and invest is a GIS based suite. So because it, this is a GIS based suite, we can compute things such as we can say that, okay, this 10% area of the forest is having this density, it is doing this much amount of carbon sequestration. This other portion of the forest is having this density and is doing so much of carbon sequestration. So what is the total amount of carbon sequestration that this whole forest is doing? To make these computations, we make use of GIS based systems, geographic information system based uh, suites, and it does a valuation of the ecosystem services. It performs computations using spatially explicit data and models. Now, because this is GIS based, so the data and the models are mostly spatially explicit. That is, they make use of positional information. And we can get final results in the form of biophysical information, such as tons of carbon sequestered, or economic information, such as the value of that amount of sequestered carbon. So with this background, let us now have a look at some ecosystem services and how do we do their valuations. The first ecosystem service is employment generation. And typically, a large number of ecosystems in the form of our protected areas give employment to people who act as guides, who act as gypsy drivers, who act as people in the hospitality sector because the tourists will be staying in some hotels so there have to be people to cook food, to serve them food, to take care of their hotel rooms and so on. So there is a large amount of employment that gets generated merely because there is a protected area that has been created. Now this employment generation can be computed as the number of man days that are generated multiplied by the wage rate. Now different people would be paid at different wages. So we can do a summation of the number of man days for each person who is getting employment multiplied by his or her wage rate. 
So this gives us a valuation of the amount of employment that is getting generated because of the in situ conservation reserve. Next we have fishing benefits. The fishing benefits can be computed as the amount of fish that gets produced multiplied by the market prices and we do a summation because uh, different species of fishes can be fetching different prices or probably different areas could be getting different prices. Similarly we can compute the fuel wood benefits as the sum over production into market prices, fodder again as a sum over production over market prices. So these are all different provisioning services that the uh, well-functioning ecosystem is providing. Fishes, fuel wood, fodder, timber, bamboo, NTFP and for all of these provisioning services we can do a summation over production into market prices. Now to look at the gene pool benefits such as the resilience of ecosystems and avenue for future use of biological compounds and their products, they can be computed using benefits transfer method. Now benefits transfer method is a method to estimate economic values for ecosystem services by transferring available information from studies already completed in another location and or context. So basically because things such as gene pool benefits are difficult to compute in each case. So what we do is that for one particular forest we can compute the, the gene pool benefits and use that particular value in the computation of ecosystem services of various different forests. So essentially if there is a forest that has been say largely used for, uh, uh, for its gene pool benefits such as the resilience of the ecosystem or for provisioning of genetic resources. So we can do a computation of how much amount of value has been added because of the services that have been derived from this particular well-functioning ecosystem. And for the other forests, we may probably not be using the gene pool, but they may be used maybe sometime in the future. So we can make a correlation and we can take values from one forest from which the gene pool has been utilized and use the same values for other forests as well. We can do carbon sequestration benefits computed as sum of carbon that has been sequestered multiplied by market prices. Now in this case those countries that are going to emit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than is permissible under their quota can purchase carbon credits from other countries that are emitting less than their own quotas. And in this case the carbon credits are traded on a world market. So we can make use of the current trading price of carbon to compute the carbon sequestration benefits. Or else we can make use of the social cost of carbon. Social cost of carbon is the cost of impacts that are caused by the emission of carbon dioxide. So if this carbon dioxide were to be emitted, if, if it were not sequestered, if it were not stored in the forest, then this carbon dioxide would have remained in the atmosphere. And that would have exacerbated the global warming and climate change. What would have been the negative consequences of that much amount of global warming or climate change? is what the social cost of carbon tries to figure out. So if there were more amount of global warming and climate change, then perhaps certain areas would be facing droughts or certain areas would be facing more impacts of hurricanes because hurricanes or cyclones, they get their energy from the top layer of uh, the sea. And if the temperatures go up, then more amount of energy is available, meaning that we will get more number of cyclones and more destructive cyclones. Now, what would be the damage that they, that they would have caused? Now, that amount of damage can be divided into several different categories. And one such category is the amount of carbon dioxide that is there in the atmosphere. So we can compute the carbon sequestration and carbon storage benefits 
by doing the total amount of carbon that is sequestered and stored multiplied by the social cost of carbon which is the cost of impacts that are caused by the emission of carbon dioxide were it not sequestered and stored similarly we can look at the water provisioning benefits by sum of water provisioned into market prices so total amount of water that the ecosystem is providing to people at different locations multiplied by the market prices of water in those locations will give us the valuation of the water provisioning benefits similarly we can look at water purification benefits the amount of water purified multiplied by the average cost of treating water by doing a replacement so if the water was not being purified by the forest or by the wetlands then perhaps we would have needed to set up a water purification facility what is the cost of setting up that facility what is the cost of running and maintaining that facility is the amount of benefit that this particular forest or wetland is providing to us so we can make use of that cost multiply that with the amount of water that is being provisioned and we can get the water purification benefits we can look at the soil and uh, the soil conservation and sediment retention benefits because the forest prevent soil erosion they conserve soil and they retain the sediments so in this case we can compute it as the sum of the amount of erosion that is avoided because of the presence of forest multiplied by the cost of damage that is being avoided now this cost of damage can be computed by say the reduced life of dams if the dams get silted then their life reduces or the cost of dredging of these dams and different waterways these are all different costs that are being avoided by the presence of the forest and the wetlands so this is one way in which we can compute the soil conservation and sediment retention benefits then nutrient retention benefits can be computed as sum of nutrients that are retained multiplied by the cost of artificial fertilizers so together with the soil the forests and the wetlands are also conserving the nutrients not just the macronutrients like nitrogen phosphorus or potassium but also a large number of micronutrients now if all of these nutrients were lost from the area then we would need to supplement them by adding artificial fertilizers what would be the cost of adding those fertilizers the cost of procurement the cost of transportation the cost of spreading those fertilizers now all of these things are being avoided just by the presence of the forests and the wetlands so this is the amount of value that they are providing biological control of pests which can be computed using benefits transfer method in which case we do a, an intensive study in one location and use the same values in other locations or by doing a computation of the cost of the pesticides that would have to be sprayed the cost of transporting those pesticides and the cost of applying those pesticides including the health costs of those pesticides because whenever we release pesticides into the environment they invariably make their way into the food chain and they reach us as well through our food so what is the cost of the the diseases that they are causing if you add all of them together we get the valuation of the Uh, pest control benefits that the forests and other ecosystems are providing similarly we can use uh, benefits transfer method for computation of things like moderation of extreme events or pollination benefits or the benefits because the forests are also acting as nursery for various species especially those species that are rare and endangered so probably sometime in the future we may require these rare and endangered species say for their medicinal purposes so what is the benefit that the, that the forests are providing just by acting as a nursery for these plants can also be computed using benefits transfer method we can also use it for habitat for various species benefits the cultural heritage benefits can be computed using contingent valuation method so for instance if people pay 
a lot of respect to a particular tree, say a banyan tree, you can ask the people in the surroundings that, okay, if this banyan tree were to be cut down, what is the amount of compensation that you feel is a reasonable compensation for accepting the loss of this banyan tree? So if you ask the people who are the stakeholders of this banyan tree, the value that they put to this uh, banyan tree, the cultural value, and then do a summation. Then you can compute the cultural heritage benefits. We can compute recreation benefits using travel cost method, meaning how many people are coming to visit a particular protected area, how much amount of money are they spending, because the people will have to spend money for travel, for accommodation, for food for getting entry into the protected area they will have to pay a cost for transportation say the uh, the cost of gypsies they will have to pay cost of hiring a guide hiring a driver and so on so what is the amount of money that people are spending now of course the value that these people are getting out of the protected areas is greater than this value uh, that they are spending and only if the value that people get is more than the amount they spend, will they spend the amount? And so we can make use of travel cost method to compute the recreation benefits. Air quality benefits can be computed using amount of air that is purified multiplied by the average cost of treating air, say by using air purifiers. Waste assimilation benefits and climate regulation benefits can be computed using benefits transfer method. Now, what are these figures like? If you look at the valuations that were done for Panna Tiger Reserve, the flow benefits are around 70 billion rupees in a year. The stock benefits are 137 billion rupees. Critical ecosystem services, water provisioning, climate regulation, waste assimilation. So we can do all these kinds of valuations and the final figure that we are getting is that the investment multiplier is 1939.36. Meaning that for every rupee that is getting invested for the protection and maintenance of Panna Tiger Reserve, we are getting benefits as high as 2000 rupees. Because the people in the surroundings, they are getting water, they are getting good soil, they are getting uh, good health and so on. So the kinds of benefits that we get from our well-functioning ecosystems are tremendous. And when we talk about conservation of the ecosystems, we need to compute these values. Only then we will be able to say that, okay, these areas should not be diverted for mining because mining will not be providing us with these high amounts of profits. Or in certain cases, these areas should not be dammed because then all of these benefits will be lost. So only when we do such computations can we arrive at these decisions. Now, often the ecosystem services are about choices because most of the benefits that the ecosystems are providing can be had from certain other ways. But then what is the choice that we wish to make as a society? For example, mangrove forests protect us from tsunamis, the impacts of tsunamis. But then as a society, we can decide that no, we do not want mangrove forest. Let us build a tsunami protection wall for a, an exorbitant amount of money and let us maintain it. This is a choice. Similarly, in the case of water purification benefits, we can either make use of wetlands as the city of New York is doing, or we can make use of water purification plants. So if a water purification plant is being set up in your locality, you can always ask the question, why don't we just conserve our wetlands? Because the wetlands will provide us with the water purification benefits, plus they will also provide other benefits, such as tourism, recreation, jobs. Similarly, we can either do artificial pollinators or we can make use of honeybees. Now, in the case of well-functioning ecosystems, we already get the pollinators for free. Whereas in countries like Israel, now people are developing systems to rear these insects, to rear honeybees and other bees to be used for pollination. 
Similarly, if we talk about sewage treatment facilities, we can make use of forest to treat our sewage. A very good example is Kakreta facility in the city of Agra. In this case, the sewage water is moved through an artificial wetland through these forests and these forests not only treat this water but also reduce the volume through the process of transpiration. And so ultimately the effluent load into the river is reduced. So these are all different choices. Now the thing is if we wanted to have these ecosystem benefits is it okay to just have a plantation forest in which case we only have a single species or do we actually need so many species? Because you will often hear the argument that okay we are cutting down this natural forest and we will raise a teak plantation. In which case we will be able to harvest timber which has a higher value and because timber uh, teak is also a tree so we will also get all the ecosystem benefits. Well it turns out that a single species can never replace the whole forest for two reasons. One is the redundancy hypothesis. The functional re uh, redundancy increases the stability of the ecosystem. One mechanism by which this happens is because the plants support each other. So in a forest, there will be leguminous soil, there will be big size trees that will support the shade loving plants, there will be tall plants that will be supporting climbers and so on. Now different plants will support each other and so this increases the stability of the forest altogether. At the same time, it also acts as a backup against the diseases and other catastrophes. So this is known as the portfolio effect. Diversification minimizes the volatility of the investment. Meaning that if you wanted to invest your money, you do not invest it only in one uh, mode. You do not just buy gold or you do not just buy real estate. If you have a sum of money, you will perhaps use some of it to buy gold, some of it to buy real estate, some of it you'll keep in the bank and so on. Because if one mode goes down, if one mode goes bust, if the price of gold reduces or if the real estate market is down, then at least you have some other ways through which you are keeping your investment safe. Now similarly, if you have a monoculture, if you only have teak plants, and if there is a disease of teak, then the whole forest is wiped off. You are left with only a bare piece of land which will get eroded in no time. But if you have a large diversity of plants, then even if there is a disease that completely wipes off one species, there will be other species to take its place. So it keeps the whole investment safe. So these two impacts help us understand why we need a well diversified ecosystem to gain most of the ecosystem benefits in the long run. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.